All right, we're ready for Revelation chapter 6 and shift gears just a little bit in our outline of the book of Revelation. This is the outline that we're following. Their first 11 chapters deal with the struggle on earth and then we shift gears there to chap in chapter 12 to deal with Christ and the dragon in the conflict. That is the reason behind this conflict here on earth. We have finished the section of God on His throne and in control, the throne scene of chapters 4 and 5. And now we're ready for chapters 6 through 11. This is the opening of the seven seals. And we begin opening those in chapter 6. We have six of the seven, and then we will not get to the seventh until we'll skip that uh, in chapter 7. You'll see an interlude in chapter 7 here in just a moment. When we've concluded, when we came through chapter 5 now, what we saw in chapter 4 was God is on His throne and He's in control. And then we see in chapter 5, the one on the throne had a scroll in his hand, sealed with seven seals. And it was written back and front, means it's written to capacity, completely uh, written, lacking nothing. Seven seals says it's completely sealed. And so the question to us is, What's within that message? And it has to do with the future of God's people. I know it has something to do with God's eternal purpose because of verse 9 of chapter 5. But when we begin in chapter 6, if, you, if this is your first study of the book of Revelation and you haven't read into chapter 6 and chapter 7 and beyond, and you're thinking, I'd like to know what's in that scroll. I'd like to know what each one of those seals represent. This is what chapter 6 is about. We're going to see that message revealed in chapter 6 through uh, 11. Summers made this point uh, concerning chapters, the transition from 5 to 6, or actually from chapter 5 to 6 to 11, that he said the main action of the book of Revelation begins with this vision. This is a vision, and that's why we have the imagery found in chapter 6 particularly. The remainder of Revelation is in reality an explanation of the seals of this little book of destiny. That is, this book, this seal, uh, or the scroll, that is, that's what he's calling the little book, has to do with the future destiny of the people of God in this conflict with Domitian or Rome. He said, back of all history is God in Christ. In this book, we see the hand of Christ opening the seals of the book of God's dealing with men. In other words, we still see this concept of God is on his throne and in control, and God's taking care of things. And so this we don't want to leave this concept of chapters 4 and 5. God is on His throne and in control as we roll into to the opening of these seals. Now, so what we have is uh, six seals. Six of the seven seals are opened in this chapter. Not much is said about each one of those. For example, the first seal is only verse, verses 1 and 2. Second seal is verses 3 and 4. Same thing all the way through uh, uh, the fifth seal. A little more is said uh, concerning the sixth seal. Uh, so our outline basically is one to six, we have the six seals. Now we'll go to our questions in just a moment, but before we do that, I want to suggest to you the first four of these seals seem to go together. Uh, evidence of that is that they're the four living creatures that announce the first four seals. So the first living creature announces the first seal, the second, the second, and third, and on down the line to the fourth which suggests, as some writers tell us, they're going in the same direction. In other words, the four living creatures announcing the first four seals say they are tied together. Then we shift to the fifth seal, which is different than the first four. And then the sixth seal is even different than the first four and the fifth. In what sense? I think the first four deal with the, the point is the overthrow of Rome. Rome is going to be overthrown. Now, we'll talk about the distinction in those in just a moment. Uh, very, distinction of the uh, interpretations of that. But the first four are focusing on the overthrow of their enemy. Then chapter, the fifth seal focuses on the cause of that overthrow. The sixth seal focuses on the judgment. God's judgment and God's hand in that. So basically, when we wrap all the six seals together, now we haven't got to the seventh seal. That's another story. But the six seals is their enemy is going to be overthrown. God is still on his throne and in control. Make sense? So we're still rolling from that concept of chapter four. God is on his throne and in control. So um, 
Let's go to question number one. And the question is, what was the first seal and what does it represent? What was in the first seal? All right, the white horse and the rider. What does the rider have? All right. All right, and that's basically the scene. What does that represent? Seemingly victory. Now let's footnote here, we cannot afford to be uh, uh, dogmatic about the details on any of the imagery in the entire book. I think we can get the general gist, and that's what we're after here. We're getting the gist of what is the message they were to receive. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's go to question two. Let's get the second seal. What was in the second seal? What was the image when they opened the seal? I mean, he opened the seal. All right. Red horse and a rider, and what does it represent? Seemingly war. We'll talk about how we know that or why we think we know that. All right, question three, the third seal. What happened in the third seal? Black horse. And that seemed to represent famine, to follow war. And let's get the fourth seal, and then we'll... We'll come back to the fifth seal later. What's uh, question number four? The fourth seal. A pale horse. And that represents death. Death is mentioned and Hades is mentioned. And we'll come back to all of that in a moment. Well, there's very little question among commentators. By commentators, I'm, I'm suggesting that there, there are commentators all over the place on the book of Revelation. Uh, but among conservative-minded, generally well-respected commentators, there's still a variety of interpretation on the first four, but there's general agreement on the fifth and the sixth seal. Now, when we talk about the differences on the first four seals, we all come out at the same place eventually, but the difference is this. Some think that uh, they are picturing victory, that's true, but it's the victory of Christ through the spread of the gospel. And that's true that Christ is victorious through the spread of the gospel, but that doesn't seem to fit the context uh, of the book. In other words, they're suffering at the hand of Domitian, but Christ is going to be victorious through the gospel. That doesn't seem to fit the flow of the context here. Maybe it does. I'll leave that to you to decide for yourself. Others think that it's a temporary victory of Rome, that it's picturing Rome as being victorious. And so Rome has a, a, a temporary victory but God's going to bring judgment in the sixth seal uh, because of the persecution of the fifth seal. Uh, that doesn't necessarily make sense to me. It seems to give uh, intended, the whole book is seem to in, be intended to give encouragement to those who are oppressed. And I think it's probably talking about the overthrow of Rome. And so thinks some that I rely on heavily, that is uh, Summers, Haley, Harkrider, um, King and others, I think, think this, along that line that this has to do with the overthrow of Rome, that there is victory over Rome. There is going to be victory over Rome. And so this Domitian that has the upper hand, you think maybe they're not ever going to be overthrown. God is on his throne, chapter 4, and it is going to be overthrown. And so there's going to be victory. Well, why? Because they're persecuting God's people, fifth seal, God brings his judgment, the sixth seal. Now, look at chapter 1 and verse 1. Whatever he's talking about, these were things that were to shortly to take place. Chapter 1 and verse 1. Chapter 4 and verse 1, as the throne scene opened, he's going to show some things that must take place after this. So these were things that were about to take place. This is not a picture of the distant future, the end of time, obviously, but having to do with judgment in time. Questions or comments before we look at each one of these seals? All right, if we look at a key verse for the chapter, and I've tried to give that to you each time, I think it would be verse 1 that uh, the, one of the living creatures said as they opened the first seal, come and see. Come and see what's, you want to know what's in this scroll? You want to know what the, the seals are all about? Come and see. And uh, we are going to do that ourselves. All right, let's talk about the first seal. What takes place? He said, uh, when I saw the lamb open the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures 
saying with the voice of thunder, come and see. Now remember, this is in a vision. So anything's possible in a vision. And when he looked, what did he see in the vision? He saw, first of all, a white horse. White would seem to be symbolic of victory. Uh, because there seems to be some significance of color here. There's white and there's red and there's black and there's pale. And white is a, vict is, is a sign of victory or color of victory. What did the rider have? The one that sat on the horse had a, a bow. That's an instrument of war uh, in that day and time. Now, if we saw in our day and time an, uh, a, a gun or a tank or some kind of uh, powerful weapon, that may be a symbol of war, but for that day and time, this would be a symbol of war. Then there is a crown. What would that suggest? Victory. He's wearing a crown. He's victorious. And so here's one going out on a white horse. He has an instrument of war. He has the color of victory. He has the crown of victory. And he's going out and he was told, he went out conquering and to conquer. In other words, Rome will be conquered. I think that's the point. You say, well, uh, if, if you take the position as, as somehow that this is talking about the victory that Rome experienced, then they're going to conquer for a while. But I think it's the fact that Rome is going to be conquered. And we're told why in the fifth seal. Uh, here is a quotation from Summers. Summers makes the point that the horseman is not a Roman, but a Parthian, cavalryman, and most the most dreaded enemy that Rome ever had. The Roman warriors did not use a bow, however. It was the favorite weapon of the uh, Parthians. And so Summers argues that this doesn't have reference to Rome's victory, but the victory against Rome because they did not have that imagery um, in, their, in their weaponry. Another quotation from Summers, this summarizes what this, this first seal is about. Thus is pictured to the Christians that victory is coming. Mighty Rome is not always to stand. Outside conquest will be part of the method of her destruction. God held in his hand the means of deliverance for his people, just like he did with Babylon, just like he did with Assyria, just like he did with every nation under the heavens. God holds this nation in their hand, and he's going to control Rome, and he's going to control his people, and he's going to bring Rome down. So there is going to be conquering and victory over Rome. Is it going to take place soon? Now think about what you've already read in the seals. Is it about to immediately take place? And the answer is, got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. <laughs> no, it's not going. How do I know that? From which seal tells me it's not immediately going to take place? It's not the first seal. It's not the second. It's not the third. It's not the fourth. It's not the sixth. Fifth. Yeah, it's the fifth seal. Because the question is, how long will, uh, until you avenge? And verse 11 says, just be patient and wait a while. Does that make sense? So this is not about to immediately take place. So it's not in the first four or the six. It's in the fifth seal that tells us this is not immediately going to take place. Not, not in the sense that, that they're waiting for Domitian to fall this week or next week, but it's going to be just a little bit. But it's going to take place. All right, makes sense? This victory, it's an imagery of victory. And that's what the, the recipient of the letter is supposed to get from this. Here is a symbol of victory over their enemy. God's going to be victorious. God is still on his throne and in control. Don't ever forget chapter 4. You, are you beginning to see why I say chapter 4 is the pinnacle of the book? Because everything builds off of that. Everything else from here on out is going to point back to that flag hanging on chapter 4 that God is still on his throne and in control. We're looking at that banner. All right, let's go to the second seal. Now, what happens in the second seal? He said, in the second seal, there was another living creature. And what'd he say? Come and see. Let's come and see what's going on here. And when he turned and he saw, what'd he see this time? A red horse. Um, and what else did he see or hear? All right. Yeah, the rider was allowed to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. Sounds like anarchy, doesn't it? And there was given to him a great sword. 
Again, anything's possible in a vision. So he sees this rider on a red horse. And his mission is he's taking peace from earth. People are killing one another. And furthermore, uh, he had this great sword. Red seems to be the color of conflict or war. If you had to picture uh, a picture of war, if you had to paint a picture of war, I don't think you would use maybe yellow. I don't think you would use uh, blue. Now, I'm colorblind, but I can see the difference in blue and red. And red would be the symbol of war, blood being shed, wouldn't it? And that seems to be the point here, that it's the picture of conflict and war. And that's the, the uh, it seems the only natural that a red horse, the bloody means of carrying out that victory of, of the first seal. So how's that victory going to take place? Well, there's going to be this bloody conflict uh, that follows close behind that white horse. So the white horse, this victory, there was bloodshed in order to accomplish that. Uh, there's going to be this bloody war, this bloody conflict. Um, now, verse 4, when it says the people kill one another, that may suggest if some, I believe Summers was one and Haley perhaps another that suggested, that may describe anarchy, that in the midst of war, there's often anarchy where there's people killing one another. Not only the act of war where this nation is killing the people of this nation and these are fighting back and killing them, but there's people fighting each other and uh, killing one another and there's anarchy that reigns because of, uh, rather than Rome having control, anarchy begins to set in. Make sense? Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. I can't be, but that seems to make sense to me um, in the second seal. Questions? Comments? All right. And we're going to get to the persecution in the fifth seal here in just a moment. All right, let's go to the third seal. Well, Summers summarized that saying, war is the bloody means of carrying out the conquest, and it's only natural that the red horse should follow the white one. All right, third seal. What do we see in the third seal? The third seal was opened. Come and see, the third living creature said. Remember, there's four of those, so here's the third. And he said, and I looked and I saw a... Black horse, and what did the rider have? A pair of scales or balances. Get the picture of balances or scales. Um, and so your footnote will say one or the other. Perhaps your translation may have varying terms. So he has scales in his hand. And he said, I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. What did the voice say? All right. That seems to have reference to famine. Famine follows on the hills of war often. We see that in our own day and time where one nation invades another, then there's a famine or at least there's, there's a lack. Black is the color of darkness and gloom and depression. So following the war, there is no longer a picture of victory on the part of Rome they're black now, they're, they're doomed, there's darkness, there's depression. The price, the scales and the price of the wheat may suggest some form of rationing. And so the way, well, that may be the idea of the scales are weighing out, that uh, you don't have an abundance of wheat, but you're going to get your portion, your ration of that. Um, that often follows in the wake of, of war. The cost that is described here, your footnote may say, a quart of wheat for a denarius. If you have the New King James, you look at your footnote, it says about a day's wage for a worker. In other words, the price is 10 to 12 times higher than, the, than normal. And so uh, in the midst of a famine, often prices of food go sky high. So you're paying 10 to 12 times or maybe greater for some food because it's being rationed, because there's a lack thereof. And so here, Rome, that seems to be all-powerful, they're going to be facing this in time to come. God's going to have judgment upon them. Um, now, famine always follows in the wake of war. Summers summarized that. Questions or comments on the third seal? Now, that may represent something else. I don't know in the context of there being war and there's bloodshed. Uh, then in the third one, that is the, the idea of a black horse suggests something terrible, something dark, something black, and it would seem to be perhaps a famine. 
All right, now this is the fourth that's going in the same direction and these are tied together because now the fourth living creature announces when this seal is opened, come and see. Verse 7. This time what did he see? He saw a pale horse. And um, the name of the one that sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him. So here's, uh, this is interesting. Uh, the, turn, the, the, uh, the color pale, uh, some have suggested, is quite significant, uh, fitting with his mission. Uh, we'll get to the mission here in just a moment. But the writer's name was Death, and then Hades, personifying Hades, followed along with him. So Death is pictured as a person. Hades is the realm of the dead, is pictured as, as a being in this vision because anything's possible in a vision and they're riding along. And so in other words, this, pow- this, this rider was given the power, uh, according to verse, to, 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 to verse 8, that he was given power over what? A fourth of the earth to do what? Kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. Now let's talk about all of those. Um, what does that suggest to you? What, what, what picture are you getting? All right. Absolutely. Uh, what else? We'll come back to that. Ukraine. All right, all right. Anything else? I like this quotation from Summers. Uh, said, all of the above, the military conquest, the war, the famine, the pestilence, are forces, of, uh, forces God can use to destroy the oppressor of his people. Uh, his Christians are to take courage. The cause is not lost by any means. In other words, God can use a number of tools. Let's go back to verse, verse 8. That here comes this, uh, as a result of the war and the famine, there comes death. And so that's the pale horse, and death is riding on that. So here comes death in the realm of Hades that receives the dead. And the name of the horse, I mean, the name of him that said on the horse was, was death. And he was given power over a fourth of the earth. Now, we'll talk about the fourth in a moment. But notice this, this uh, verse 8. He can kill by means of a sword, that is by war, by hunger, and with death and by beasts. In other words, God has a number of tools in his tool belt by which he can bring a nation down. He can bring them down economically. He can bring them down through a famine from from lack of uh, food. He can bring them down through war, through outside uh, invasion. God often did that. He did that with nations in the Old Testament. But let's look at this idea of a fourth of the earth. That the power, there was given power over a fourth of the earth. Which may suggest that destruction is not complete. Rome is going to be overthrown, but there's not going to be utter destruction. Rome will fall, but it's not utter destruction where they're completely gone and never exist at all. Does that make sense? So he's given power over a fourth of the earth. Not complete. Not utter and complete destruction. All right, before we get to the fifth seal, let's talk about those first four seals. Any questions or comments? Interesting, it is. Exactly. Yeah, and, and which that was written in this highly symbolic language. Um, good point, good connection. Yes, ma'am.
Good point. Good point. Yeah, God's, God's on his throne. He's giving this power. They're giving this control. Let's put this in our, in our perspective in our day and time. Let's just suppose that another nation overpowers our nation, and it's an evil nation, and they're persecuting Christians, and they're targeting those who believe in God and believe in Christ. And they begin to kill out those who are Christians, and we're wondering, is there any, is there any light? Is there anything coming? Is there any hope in the future? Or, or are we just going to all be stamped out? Is that what's going to happen? And suppose we get a message written in code language like this, and we are familiar with Zechariah, we're familiar with Revelation, but suppose we got a message that talked about this white horse and the rider, and then we saw this red horse and the rider, and the black horse and the pale horse, and we get the picture there's going to be war, there's going to be victory over the, uh, the oppressor, there's going to be famine, there's going to be death and destruction. Would that give you any encouragement? Sounds like hope, yeah that there is a brighter future. And that's going to lead to a question now in the fifth seal. And so let's go to the fifth seal now, and let's talk about the souls under the altar. We don't have the horse now riding. So those first four tied together because it all deals with horses, and they're tied together because of the four living creatures announcing that. The living creatures are not announcing anymore. So what we have in the fifth seal are the souls under the altar. So he opened the fifth seal, and when that took place, he said, I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they held. Now, can you see a soul? No, but in a vision, anything's possible. So he saw that in this vision. So what he's focusing on in the fifth seal is the reason for the overthrow of Rome that was described in the first four seals. So Rome is going to be overthrown, first four seals. It's the persecution of God's people is the reason for that. It's not just that it's time for this nation to go so I can bring in another nation and let them take their place. God's bringing Rome down because of what they did to his people. So in the Old Testament, as a sacrifice was offered, the blood that was offered would flow down under the altar so as the... Christians are being offered, or they're being persecuted, as they're being killed, it's as if they have their souls like blood have flowed up under the altar. That's the point. So he said, what I saw was those who had been slain, they were under the altar, they were slain for the word of God. What does that mean? Martyrdom, yeah. What's the connection with the word of God? Yeah, because of their allegiance to the Word. Where have we seen that phrase before in this book? First chapter, verse 9. Remember, John was on Patmos for the Word of God and the testimony of Christ. He was there for the word of God. In other words, I take that in harmony with this, that he was there because of his allegiance. He was banished to Patmos because of his allegiance to the word of God. Here are souls that are under the altar. They were slain. Why? For the word of God. In other words, if people were being killed because of their faithfulness, would you be slain for the word of God? Your allegiance to the word of God. Is there enough evidence that they'd slay, slay you? That's a good question, isn't it? Is there enough evidence in my life that I'm adhering to the word of God that they would slay me for that? And then he says, and for the testimony which they held. What does that suggest to you? Yeah, the, 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 their cry was a plea uh, and uh, their testimony which they held to, uh, in other words, they, they held to the testimony and the things that they held to, that, that Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. That's the same idea as for the word of God. Now, what was their cry at verse 10? How long? In other words, in view of the victory of the first seal and the war and the conquering, they wonder perhaps, has God forgotten his people? 
And so their question at verse 10 is, how long, Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In other words, we've been killed because of our allegiance, and they're still, they're still pressing on. How long do you take care of that enemy? How long do you take care of Rome? How long until you bring vengeance on Rome? And what was God's answer? He gave them a white robe. What's that suggest? Purity and victory. He gave each one of them a white robe. And then he said something to them. Verse 11. They should rest a little longer. Now we'll talk about until, when. We'll finish that out in a moment. But what does that tell you? Just, just stop right there. Wait a little longer. God said wait a little longer. Be patient. In other words, God has a different timetable than we do. God works on a different clock than we do. I want it now. I want it now. I want to see justice now. I want relief now. And God said, wait a little bit. God has a different timetable than I do. And so maybe you're wondering, why don't God do thus and so? Why don't he bring the world to an end? It's so wicked and corrupt. God said, just wait a while. I'm on a different timetable. I've got a different clock than you've got. I'm not working on your clock. How long were they to wait until when? Or not how long, but until when? What does that mean? You're correct, but what does that mean? There's more to come. In other words, you've been slain for the word of God. There are others that are going to be slain before this is over. So why didn't God bring it to, to an end when they wanted it? God's got a different timetable, and God said, wait. Now, I'm going to make a statement that you may not agree with, and you may think it's uh, out of place. And especially if you're in my case where you've just recently lost a loved one, but death is not a big deal to God. Would you agree with that? That's not a big deal to God. You see, when, when, when someone dies, you think, oh, this is, this is, and it is terrible. That ain't a big deal to God. Because life is just temporary anyway. Life is just a short picture, very short picture of eternity. And that's not a big deal to God. So, so those that die in service to the Lord, there's a picture of eternity the fact that they lose their physical life is not a big deal. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. I hope it does to you. All right. Um, any questions on the fifth seal? I wonder if uh, John writing this was talking about himself, about these martyrs left behind, and that kind of thing. Do you think it's very next one? I may be the next one. Summer, summarize this fifth seal saying this paragraph reflects the moral necessity for judgment. God cannot be a righteous God and allow such evil to go unavenged. The chief reason for God's judgment on Rome empowers the persecution of his people. And uh, I'll stop with that. He uh, captured the thought. Let's go to the sixth seal. And let's get the sixth seal. When the sixth seal was opened, what, what happened? There was an earthquake. Sun became black. And the moon became like blood. And then what happened to the stars? They fell like figs falling from a tree that was shaken by a mighty wind. And then the sky was rolled up. Uh, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth and the rich men and mighty men, etc. They went in the caves and the rocks, the mountains and hid. And they went to the mountains and the rocks. And they said to the mountain rock, fall on us and hide us basically from him who sits on the throne in the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come. All right. What's going on in this sixth seal? Well, that seems to be the picture of judgment. Um, these are all expressions of judgment. In the Old Testament, this is not the final judgment in the end of time. This is judgment upon a nation. Uh, we don't have time to go into all the details, but the earthquake was used in Isaiah 29 and God's punishment upon Judah. The sun being darkened and the moon turning to blood was similar language used in Isaiah chapter 13 and Joel 2 to deal with Babylon and then later Judah and even of other nations. The stars falling was used in Ezekiel chapter 32, Joel 2, Amos 5, and even Matthew 24 concerning the Jewish nation. These are all descriptions of the downfall of a nation. When a nation collapses, here's the picture. When a nation falls and collapses, it's as if the sun doesn't dark. So let's suppose in the morning when you wake up and you turn on the news, 
that you've learned that there is no United States anymore. We don't exist anymore as a nation. Now, the people are still here, but our government is gone. We don't have a president, we don't have a vice president, we don't have a Congress, we don't have a Supreme Court. It's all gone. It's gone. And someone else is in control from another country. I want to tell you, that'd be just like the sun not shining. It'd be like getting the news, the, the moon fell, or all the stars fell, or like there's been a major earthquake. In other words, it's major upheaval, an overthrow of a nation. And so this is God's judgment on a nation, just like we saw with Babylon. Now, you say, why didn't he just say the nation's going to be overthrown? Well, this is encrypted language. And those who are reading are familiar with Isaiah 13. We're familiar with Isaiah 13. We know what that means because we've studied Isaiah and we studied Ezekiel and all of those. Now, any questions on that? It's just basically the fall, and this has to do with the execution of the wrath of the Lamb. The nation is going to fall. <clears throat> So here's what we have. We have the six seals. We have the Rome is going to be overthrown. Verse uh, chapter, I mean, uh, seals one to four. Why? Because of the persecution in the fifth seal. Then here is the judgment, the overthrow of the nation in the sixth seal. Now then, the chapter ends on this note. The chapter ends on this note, and that is, who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? What's the answer to that? Anybody read ahead? The 144,000. Where am I going to see that? Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is an interlude. So you, you thought, okay, well, maybe if you, if you haven't really studied thoroughly Revelation, you're thinking, okay, the seventh chapter's got to deal with the seventh seal. We don't get to that for a little bit. What we have in the seventh chapter is an interlude. It's an answer to this question. Who can stand against the wrath of the Lamb? The 144,000. So we're going to study about the 144,000. And that's not a literal term, but it's 144,000. So under any condition, this part of the pageant symbolizes God's destructive power, talking about the, the, fifth, the sixth seal, against those who reject his plan of salvation and these forces, conquest, war, famine, pestilence, natural calamity, rage. Who is able to stand? And the answer to that's found in the next chapter, and that is the 144,000. I want to make sure I'm in the 144,000. Make sense? We have time for maybe uh, one or two practical lessons. Question number whatever that is. Number eight. Practical things you take home with you from this chapter. Can't hide from God. That's good. What else? He's on his throne. He's in control. Say again. All right. There comes a time when it's too late for repentance. What else? All right, very good. We learned there's times we're going to suffer for our allegiance to the Word, and I learned that God has a different timetable than me. I'm ready for God to deal with something now, but God may be saying, wait just a little bit. I've, I've, got, I've got a different plan in mind, and we need to remember that. Chapter 7 next time.